Hi there viewers of Equinox Television, 6 p.m. by 6 o'clock, it's time for the news. Thank you so much for always being there. Our major stories right away as usual. Four days to the celebration of the Unity Day on May 20. Activities are already upbeat across the national territory despite the rising tension in the northwest and southwest regions of the country. Some alleged separatist fighters in the Indian Division reportedly dropped their arms recently. Plus, we will be taking you down memory lane on the history of May 20 in Cameroon. And Cameroon's international boxer Francis Nganu crossed carpet. He is now the chairman of the Professional Fighters League in Africa. Viewers, those are our major stories. Details and more in just a moment. Welcome back viewers, thank you so much for always being there. My name is Anna Bilaluku. We just told you in the headlines that few days to the celebration of the Unity Day in Cameroon, tension continues in the two English-speaking regions of the country. Recently, self-styled generals Baron and Jeboy, including other 16 separatist fighters allegedly in the Indian Division have surrendered their arms to the administration. The senior divisional officer for the Indian Division says, for years now, the two self-styled generals and their comrades gave defense and security elements and also the local population of the entire Indian Division a severe nightmare. Let's now have more ways as Southwest Regional correspondent David Sinmaimo. Dibo David Dibo, alias General Baron of Ilo Village, Ekpe Jerome, alias General Jeboy of Ikasa, and 18 self proclaimed amber fighters from Ilo and Irad villages on Dian Division turn in themselves and their ammunition to the administration of Dian Division. This is General Baron. These are my boys. So I will use this opportunity to thank uh, the SDO, the civil who are still alive. So I just want to thank Mr. Kedi Mayor, one of our, one of our brother. He was the one who was cooperating with us this short time. He met them on Facebook. How will I do this thing? I want to do the hard mercy. I want to go back to the government. Are you sure? I say, I'm sure. Are you sure? I say, I'm sure. I say, okay. This is how you do until this day. So I will make a clean apology for the government to work as a Cameroonian. Indian administrative head, Gibet Gubai Baldena, senior divisional officer, saluted their courage before making a clarion call for others still in the bushes to do the same. I'm the SDO, but you see, I'm here with General Baron who disturbed us for many years, but he came back. I want to tell the other who are in the bush to come out and to participate in the development of our country. This accomplishment could not have been successful if not for the relentless effort of the commander of the 21st Marine Battalion of Mondemba, Aurelien Ronald de Benoit Mbindang Ngema. He loved was like a war zone. So many people have been crying, coming to Mundemba, saying that they will die, they will die. And I believe that, from what they are telling us, we will have peace along Mundemba. The Marine Commandos, under his supervision, are fighting tirelessly to ensure Mundemba and the entire Indian Division enjoy relative peace and tranquility as they still exist what is termed a pocket of resistance from some separatist fighters group. The intimidation was too much. Even if we went to drain all these things because of intimidation. So we realized to ourselves, you know, to say anyhow we want to be, let us see. Die is die. Let us come and surrender our, ourselves. It should be recalled that these young men, just like their brothers in other areas in the northwest and southwest regions, took up arms against the state of Cameroon within the framework of marginalization with the aim of separating the country, giving rise to what is known today as the Anglophone Armed Conflict. 
And now we continue talking about the National or the Unity Day preparatory activities ahead of the upcoming 51st edition of the National Day in the West region have been launched in Bafang. During the activities, the people pray for peace to return to the West region and other parts of the country, especially in the Northwest and Southwest. Mala Glory is a lady on the beat. In assorted traditional ways, the locals of Bafang, including students, march the streets to the Bafang ceremonial ground as they launch preparatory activities ahead of the 51st edition of the National Unity Day in the West region of Cameroon. It's about living together. That is what the Lord is expecting from us. As part of preparative activities, a mass was organized to pray for an end of the numerous atrocities going on in the country, such as killings, kidnappings, and the ongoing Anglophone crisis. At this moment in time, we pray for grace and your protection as we prepare for the 51st edition of the National Day. With their traditional wares representing different tribes in Cameroon, the people march while waving flags as a symbol of unity. The call for the return of peace in Cameroon. And now ahead of the May 20 National Day celebration, we now take you down memory lane into the history of that day 51 years ago. Babila Jonathan tells us what happened on the 20th of May 1972 in the report which comes up next. Cameroon took the unitary turn on May 20, 1972. After enumerating economic and development advantages of the unity system of government, the then federal head of state, President Amadou Aijo, appealed to the nation for massive support in a referendum on the draft constitution which will immediately establish a republic, one and indivisible, with one government and one assembly. The referendum question was to be, do you approve with a view to consolidate national unity and accelerating the economic, social, and cultural development of the nation, the draft constitution instituting a republic, one and indivisible, to be known as the United Republic of Cameroon. The draft constitution made English and French the official languages of the nation. Cameroonians gave their president overwhelming support at the polls during the referendum. At the national level, 3,236,280 people registered for the referendum. Out of these, 3,177,846 voted in favor of the unitary state, 176 voted against it. 1,612 ballots were declared null and void and 56,649 voters abstained. At the level of the state of West Cameroon, 737,850 persons registered for the referendum, 716,774 of whom voted for the unitary state and 87 voted against it, and 13,980 34 registered voters abstained. 1,053 ballot papers were declared invalid. In the state of East Cameroon, there were 2,461,072 voters in favor of the unitary state, 87 against it, and 559 ballots declared null and void, out of a total of 2,504,000 430 registered voters. When the results of the referendum were declared, the president congratulated the electorate and said that it had just signed the birth certificate of the United Republic of Cameroon, which later became the Republic of Cameroon in 1984 by presidential decree of President Paul Beer. 
Thank you so much, Babila Jonathan, for that report. Now we talk something else. There has been a controversy surrounding the construction of the Kakatari stretch of road in Marwa. Marwa is in the far north region of the country. The road, which has been under construction for over eight years now, is affecting the day-to-day -day activities of the local population as movement has been perturbed somehow. While the population blamed the company in charge of the works, the company in charge in turn says the government has not signed any concrete contracts with them. Lucy Liengu is here, has more. The road construction project in Kakatare, locality Mara, Far North region, has been in execution for over eight years. After being handled by a military engineer, it was entrusted to a private company by the government. For a while, movement in and around Kakatare has become difficult. Business persons and road users now struggle to transport their goods or carry out daily activities. La, si la route passe, on avoir ce if the road was accessible, we wouldn't have issues. Sometimes my clients call for me to come get their loans because they can't make it to my shop. I take upon myself to trek just to have the materials with me. When I finish sewing, I'm forced to deliver at their place. Bringing it home, instead of them to pay for my services, they frame stories or propose to send via orange money. Today, the population of Mawa accused the company in charge of works to have collected money without the realization of the project. Meantime, the company in charge of works debunks all allegations levied on them, saying they haven't signed any contract or received a penny from the government for the execution or start of the second phase of works. Le 27 février. Il y avait la descente du Madame le Ministre. On the 27th of April, the Minister of Housing and Urban Development, she instructed the company to mobilize while waiting for the contract. Till today, nothing has been done. The little that has been done so far is from the company itself. Because we can't watch our brothers suffer. There is nothing, no contract. The city mayor of Mara, Dr. Sali Babani, visited the site. According to him, the most important important thing is to ensure that construction works continue smoothly. We now move to this very interesting cultural piece. A nine-year-old primary school pupil has been crowned fond of Baba One a village in Babesi subdivision that is in the Ngoketunja division of the northwest region of the country. His Royal Majesty Fon Fuen Kangape II now has the destiny of the village in his hands after his father on May 2 traveled to the land of no return to meet his ancestors. The crowned Fon has been receiving high profile guests at his palace in Yaoundé where he traveled to after his enthronement. Innocent as there is among that bit. The destiny of Baba Wan village in Babesi subdivision, Gokitunja division of the northwest region, lies in the hands of nine-year-old Fon Fuen Kangape II. He was chosen as a new traditional ruler on May 8th by kingmakers to succeed his father. His royal majesty Fon Fuekemshi II, who disappeared or better still gave up the ghost on May 2nd, 2023. He was chosen in respect of the Baba Wan tradition, which is direct father to son, and the young ruler is the son of the late Fon's last wife, who lived with the Fon until his disappearance. Other wives with older children, according to sources, were no longer in the palace, favoring the primary school people. After the identification and catching, he was enthroned as the new Fon of Baba Wan. <laughs> with all the traditional rites and rituals performed. The young ruler, His Royal Highness Ufuen Kangape II, traveled to his Baba Wan Palace in Yaoundé Center region, accompanied by notables. He was welcomed by his people who assembled at the palace in their numbers.
While at the palace, His Royal Majesty Fue Kangape II was visited by different traditional rulers and authorities who presented him their encouragements and best wishes and in return received the fund's blessings. One of such authorities is Senator von Chaffa Isaac. Thank you. <laughs> as young as he is, it is the collaboration of his people and the continuous guidance and orientations of the elders that the customs and tradition of the Baba Wan people will be preserved as well as improve the standard of living through development, unity and peace. Interesting indeed, long live the fun. And now we talk sports. Cameroon's Francis Ngannou is now the chairman of the Professional Fighters League in Africa. This is one amongst other benefits that the 36-year-old benefited from his new contract. And still in sports, Eric Mbacha wins the Helsinki Marathon in Finland for a fourth consecutive time. Smart Dikan Gabriel has the details. Francis Ngannou now has a new company to work with after being a free agent for several weeks. Francis Ngannou has signed an unusual multi-fight contract labeled as a strategic partnership with the Professional Fighters League, PFL. The deal gives a leadership and equity roles mixed in the martial arts company while also letting him to pursue outside boxing fights. Even though the themes of the deal didn't state what Francis Ngannou will earn in terms of money and the duration of the contract with PFL as part of the agreement, Francis Ngannou becomes the chairman of PFL Africa, which is an expansion initiative to produce events on the continent and he will serve on the company's advisory board to represent the fighters' interests. The reason why I signed with the PFL is because of their willing to develop the sport. Most importantly, in Africa, I stand for my people, for my community, I fight for them. And to get something like this to bring back home is like a huge accomplishment. Along with the PFL, now that I'm in the position to speak, to fight for those who doesn't have a voice because at the end of the day it's fighter first fighter is the one doing the sport francis Ngannou, who moved to the united states of america after beginning his mixed martial arts career in france entered the ufc in 2015 and became the heavyweight champion in 2021 before francis Ngannou fought his last fight in 2022 he was prepared to leave the promotional company if they could not reach an agreement with him on a new contract he has always been my goal to control my own destiny when somebody feel respect you get the best out of the person in athletics, Cameroon's Eric Mbacha Mange has picked up his fourth consecutive title of the Helsinki Marathon. Over the weekend, Eric Mbacha Mange covered the 42-kilometer distance in 2 hours, 26 minutes, 14 seconds, implying he ran at 3.28 minutes per kilometer. It was since 2019 that Mbacha Eric Mange started winning the Helsinki Marathon. The native of Nkambe in the Dungamantum division of the Northwest region moved to Finland due to alleged separatist threat for participating at the Mount Cameroon race in 2019. Eric Mbacha Mange has won the mountain race on three occasions, 2011. 2014 and 2019. And now viewers, on that health note, we put a cap on the first part of the news, but don't go away. As usual, talking points comes up next, so stay with us.
Welcome back, viewers. Today we will be talking health, and our guest tonight is Professor Mobit Paul. He is a medical practitioner or a medical expert, to be more precise. He is an oncologist. Professor, we thank you so much for accepting to be our guest on Talking Point tonight. And recently, you just attended a global health summit against cancer in the U.S. of A. Can you tell us, Professor, uh, what was the focus of your discussions in the U.S. recently? Thank you once more for inviting me to Equinox Television. Uh, I was not a keynote speaker at the Global Hall Catalyst Summit, which just uh, uh, ended at the University of Pennsylvania. I was one of the speaker, but not a keynote speaker. There were several speakers. There were ambassadors. There were head of corporations. They were physicians, they were scientists, they were, were even a church leader. So it was really um, uh, a summit consisting of various individuals representing uh, diff different aspects of global health. Um, I talked uh, on, uh, on, on, on cancer in Cameroon and also what Cameroon Oncology Center, which is the center I founded located in Bikuku what it is doing on the ground to combat cancer. Looking at the statistics, there are about 800,000 deaths resulting from uh, cancer in Africa. Uh, for the case of Cameroon, we have about 30,000 new cases and uh, 15,000 deaths. Uh, these are estimated uh, figures. So cancer is a significant burden for Cameroon and for all of the developing countries. It is estimated that 80% uh, of all new cancer cases occur in the developing world. And so where they have very few resources to combat the disease. Uh, yes, Professor, let's now talk more about um, the statistics. Can you tell us the figures of cancer treatment on the African continent and Cameroon to be more precise? Let's talk detailly on it. Does not have the medical platform, so equipment and personnel. The few that are present in terms of equipment and personnel are found in South Africa and in North, and, and in North Africa. So Egypt, Morocco, um, Tunisia, and South Africa. Now other countries like uh, Kenya, Ghana, um, are beginning to make uh, some inroad. But in general, the equipment and personnel is absolutely lacking. I can give you some examples. Um, there are more than 30 countries in Africa that do not have a radiotherapy facility. And even the ones that are present, even the radiotherapy facilities that are present are based on 1960 technology. Uh, and it's really not, um, it's not very useful in some cases. So you have in the United States, just as an example, for one million of the population, you have 13 linear accelerators. In Cameroon, we have a single linear accelerator that is devoted uh, to cancer and is found at Cameroon Oncology Center. And there was nothing like that before we installed our medical linear accelerator. And the, it's not just Cameroon, but all the countries in Africa are facing the same issue. And now, Professor, you discuss with top health experts in the U.S. and from across the world. Now let's talk about our country, Cameroon. What plans or what are you people envisaging um, as far as bringing health care related to cancer back to the country? What plans are you people thinking? Uh, what plans do you have at bringing health care closer to the local population of Africa and Cameroon? Through uh, the conference that we attended at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, or Summit, if you want to call it, uh, we met various um, participants that are also operating optimally and high quality. 
uh, from Lagos in Nigeria, uh, one from uh, Kenya, and uh, Ocean Spring Cancer Hospital in Tanzania. And uh, they are running some protocols uh, for prostate cancer, which we believe that will benefit patients from Cameroon. So uh, we are beginning to dis uh, have some discussion with them to see how we can bring this protocol to benefit Cameroonians. These protocols are also being supported uh, by and monitored by some of the high uh, um, Ivy League universities that I mentioned earlier. That's uh, John Hopkins, Harvard, University of Pennsylvania uh, radiation program. So these are very high quality uh, uh, program that we are trying to bring to Cameroon. This um, third thing I will say is that we are also in the process of developing some protocols. Again, we have had some discussions of some of the lively people that will participate in this program, and that is also a way to bring high quality program to Cameroon. And now, Prof, before we take leave of you, let's talk about the oncology center. The problem, most of the problem, uh, one of the problems Cameroonians face, especially those uh, who are sick of cancer-related diseases, is the cost of cancer treatments, which seems to be very high in our country. Uh, what is the oncology center doing to reduce the cost of cancer treatments to patients in Cameroon? In terms of reducing cost, Right now, Cameroon Oncology Center is operating at about 25 to 35% capacity. As I indicated previously, we are working with the government to increase the capacity to 100%. If, when this happens, the cost will, will be minimized. So patients, because we are going to spread the cost of operations to a higher number of patients and therefore the cost will be the cost will, be, will go down but cancer care is not cheap if you buy a linear selector for 3.5 million dollars and it's going to cost you 215,000 US dollars per year to operate a linear accelerator combined with the cost of electricity which we know that uh, power in Cameroon is not stable that increases the cost. So this cost uh, is the reason that 30 countries in Africa do not have radiotherapy, even though they need it. Thank you so much, Professor Paul Morbid, for accepting to be our guest on Talking Point tonight. Just to precise once again that you are an oncologist and you just recently attended the Global Health Summit in the US of A. Thank you again for being our guest and we shall be coming back to the treatment of cancer and also what the Oncology Center has been doing that will be in subsequent news editions. And viewers, we thank you so much for always being there. As usual, don't go away. Our programs continue. The news comes up at 8 p.m. And Equinox War comes up in about 30 minutes or so. Thanks again for being with us. Bye-bye for now.